right. Welcome to the next episode of our special guest series here on Behind the Football Stripes. Uh, welcoming a just recently retired Major League Baseball umpire, uh, Greg Gibson. Greg uh, started in Major League Baseball in 1997, working his first game, officially hired in 99 and had an illustrious 20 plus year career after that. As I mentioned, just retired at the end of the 2022 season. Uh, he was no stranger to postseason, worked three wild card series, including I think the first ever one uh, in the new format back in 2012 between the Orioles and the Rangers, 10 divisional series assignments, five league championship series, worked the World Series between the Rangers and St. Louis in, in 2011, the All-Star Game in 2008 at Old Yankee Stadium, ended his career with just uh, just under 100 ejections overall, uh, became a crew chief <laughs> at the beginning of 2022, no stranger to, of course, all of us here on uh, Behind the Football Stripes, and now has pivoted into his, is doing his own thing with, uh, with insurance, and uh, so welcome to our little show here today, Greg. Well, thank you for having me. So let's go, go ahead and get started and talk about where you're at right now. You just retired. Uh, talk about what's retirement been like fresh off uh, an illustrious 20 plus year career and, and uh, um, why retire now? Well, a couple things. Last winter, um, I had COVID and pneumonia really bad. And we started, uh, we started spring training, started the season. And I kept telling my crew, something's not right. I'm not healthy. Um, uh, about passed out on the field a couple times. There was just a few incidents health-wise, and, and I kept uh, looking at the guys. And uh, uh, long story short, uh, the night I walked off the field, uh, the Mets trainer checked my blood pressure. It was 198 over 131. Ooh. And uh, as, <laughs> as I told my bosses with baseball, the night I walked off the field was not my worst day. It was the day I said I, had, I knew something was wrong, and, and I walked off. And when they got me in the ambulance, take me to the hospital, my blood oxygen level was an 86. And through Mark Harwood, who's with Major League Baseball, he was the first one to tell me the term long COVID. And uh, I was suffering from long COVID and it was issues with, uh, because my, I wasn't getting enough, you know, my ox blood oxygen level was so low, um, it was affecting my heart and lungs. And uh, uh we went through a lot of tests. We went through a lot of things. Um, we still are in doc. We go to doctors. It seems like nonstop. There's a lot. They still don't know about it. But when your cardiologist looks at you and says, yeah, Greg, you could probably go back next year, but why? Um, and when we first met, he looked at me and said, by the grace of God, you didn't have a stroke. Uh, so it was just, it was one of those things where I had only planned to really work two more years. Um, we started my insurance agency. Uh, they don't teach a man how to retire. And uh, I, I wanted something else to do. And so um, after talking with my wife and praying about some things and talking to my family, and it was just the right time. Um, what I did not want to stand in a young guy's way. Um, I did not want to be a burden uh, to my employer. Uh, I'd been pretty much a trooper. Uh, and, um, you know, it's just to the point it was time. And, um, you know, one of the things I always said was, um, uh, I want to leave while I'm still, they still think I'm good. And I think right. I did. Yep. Uh, and, and I, I just, um, I, I want to get out of the way. You know, I, I've worked with a lot of the young guys coming up and, uh, you know, I know how much that means and I know to get your life started and everything. And, you know, it's uh, Greg Gibson who, and, uh, get out of the way and let a young guy have it. Um, uh, and that's what I wanted to do. And, uh, um, I'm excited to see, you know, uh, who calls me and says, Hey, I got your job. Right. So, uh, right. I joke, I joke with Nick Marley all the time. I can't wait to give you my job. Can't wait to give you my job. And, uh, so we'll see what happens because Nick was on the field working a plate that night, I believe. Um, uh, yeah, Nick was with me. So, um, has it hit me yet? No, probably won't till spring training. Right. Um, uh, but you know, I was blessed. Um, um, I had a wonderful career. Um, I, I'm very, very thankful uh, to Major League Baseball and everything that they did. Uh, you know, I had a great employer, um, but um, it was time. And um, and I, I mean, I'm excited for the next page. Um, you know, I'm in my office today. Uh, the guys kind of laugh at me. You know, I'm usually here by 9, 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Um, I get up and have a cup of coffee, like to read, play with the dog. It's really kind of cool to get up and have a cup of coffee in, in my house. Right. So right. Uh, 
I, I'm just, you know, it's just, I get to see my mom and dad a lot. I'm just enjoying, um, um, you know, this time of year, it's a little, sometimes a little stressful, you know, they're putting crews together, um, right. you know, things are going to, you get through Christmas and it's like, here we go. Right. And this year it's like, you know, there's none right. of that. I mean, That's it's right. like it's, staying home. Um, you know, 32 years on the road is a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. So I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to hang it up. Um, and you know, I had a lot of fun. I've, I've looked back on a lot of things and, you know, I, I had, uh, there was a ton of guys I worked with. I had a lot of fun with, and I'm still going to go see them. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it was just, you know, there comes a point and I, I talk to kids and youth groups and stuff and team and sporting teams, athletes. And I tell them, I said, there's a day that make you take the uniform off, enjoy it. Every in, in my day came. Um, and you know, I have no regrets. I have absolutely no regrets. I am thrilled to be out and to be doing my next passion, which is my insurance agency. Well, that's awesome. Well, first of all, I uh, hope, you know, you're doing better uh, after COVID. Of course, a lot of people suffering from a lot of the long COVID symptoms. So I wish you all the best in you know, 100% recovery there. Um, let's take it back to, to 1997. So I think your your first game, correct me if I'm wrong, was between the Indians and the Cardinals. Um uh, it was an interleague game, but you know, at that time, you were you joined as a fill-in relief umpire in the National League in in June of 1997. What was that call like, um, and and um, and and how was that first experience working on a major league field? Well, I'm so old. Um, we had pagers. Hmm. You didn't have cell phones, right? Um, and then you went back to the room, back to your hotel room, and saw the red light flashing on your phone, and. Uh, uh, they'd had a rain out in St. Louis. Mr. Vargo called me. He was the National League supervisor at the time. Uh, I got my call to the big leagues on Friday the 13th. <laughs> kind of scary. Um, right. Next day, I got up. I was in um, uh, Rochester, New York. Um, flew to St. Louis. Worked a split doubleheader with uh, Paul Runge, Jerry Lane, Mike Winters. And uh, another uh, fill-in was Brian Gibbons. And another fill-in was uh, Paul Schreiber. And Paul's passed. Right. Uh, but um, that was my first day, uh, June 14th, 1997. And then Carter, my youngest son, was born June 14th, 2004, seven years later. So wow. June Important 14th is kind of a special day for me. So There you go. That's something to remember for sure. What was that Thanks. experience like, uh, you know, joining a major league staff? You had probably worked spring training before that, right? So you um, so you, you knew some of the guys, but stepping on that field for the first time must have been. Uh, it was in St. Louis, too. And if you've been to if you are a baseball fan and you want to go to baseball Mecca, go to St. Louis. Um, right. You miss a call that goes against the visiting team and they hold up a sign and says, you know, dink in your lives. I mean, uh, right. they are they are baseball fans through and through and through. And, um, you know, they know the game. They cheer when they need to. They it, it's it's amazing. They are, um, it, it is baseball mecca. It is sold out every night. It is not, you know, uh, St. Louis is like it, it's a very cool place if you're a baseball fan to go to during the regular season. Um, it, it it's a. I always enjoyed working there. I've worked a lot of postseason there. Uh, St. Louis was one of my favorite towns. Obviously, I worked my first game there, and then a lot of postseason and everything. But uh, 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 if you're a baseball fan. Two things I would I would suggest: go to spring training, which is you know if if every day was like spring training, I would have never retired. Um, right, it's not. But right. spring training is an awesome experience for a baseball fan because you you are able to get close. Um, you are able to you know uh, it, it is so relaxed. It's fun. Uh, everybody enjoys themselves. You know, down near the end, everybody starts cranking it up a little bit. But um, you know, from the Early on, from the, the fifth, sixth inning on, the young kids come in to play, and they play hard. Right. And it's good baseball, um, you know, when the young – because they're fighting for their lives. And if you're a baseball fan, go to spring training. Get up close. Watch it. It's just – it's a really, you know, full fan experience if you're a baseball fan. And the, go to – you know, go visit ballparks when you can. St. Louis would be one. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Yankee Stadium, Wrigley, Fenway, you know, uh, Fenway and Wrigley just because of the history. Yeah, uh, but but if, you know, um, there I talk to people all the time, and they say the fan experience. They want to go visit all thirty ballparks, and I tell them go. Uh, we got some beautiful ballparks. Um, 
we got some that are bad, but for the most part, 28 of the 30 are really nice. So, you know, go, go visit and, um, um, and see these ballparks and it, it's, um, the fan experience they're trying to do better. Uh, but, um, you know, some ballparks, I feel like they're sitting right in my ball bags. Um, there's a group of guys right. in Pittsburgh that sit right. They, it, it's kind of funny. I'll tell you this story real quick. There's a group of guys in Pittsburgh that sit right behind home plate and, um, uh, they have actually become friends of the umpires and they're part of, they, they come out to our charity now. That's awesome. Um, and, and it's kind of funny because it was several years ago, I turned around to him. I said, don't you guys have jobs? You know, cause right. all they do is come and just rag on everybody, but they're a great group of guys. They, you know, they're baseball fans and, and, uh, but uh, get out and visit Pittsburgh and uh, go to these ballparks and, and uh, enjoy it. Well, that, Be there in awesome. person, watching it on television. I don't like doing that myself. But Absolutely. if you go to the ballpark, it's a totally way different uh, experience. Absolutely, for sure. I mean, I grew up in in Baltimore, and I was very lucky to have Oriole Park in my youth. And, you know, so, of course, and, and, and I think you're absolutely right. But on, on that topic, though, you know, over the past decade or two, these major league belt parks have become, like you said, centered around the fan. They've all been very similar. How is that, you know, you, you were an umpire right during that period. How has it been umpiring in some of these really uniquely designed ballparks um, than from the olden days when they were kind of more, more cookie cutter around a particular style? They were maybe multi-purpose. Um, did that right. affect how you guys approach the game and, and your craft? Not really. It was just a cleaner. It was cleaner for the umpires. Give me an example. Turner Field in Atlanta, you could not have fan interference anywhere. Um, excuse me. Uh, you had ballparks now. You had Cincinnati with Riverfront. You had Pittsburgh with Three Rivers. The the say the stands were set back. Um, you know Pittsburgh now. I'll be I'll be honest with you. It's a beautiful ballpark. It is a nightmare for umpires because you have fan interference everywhere. Everywhere. And it's not as and I, I will say that with this, it's not as bad now with replay with fan. The young guys think nothing of fan interference with uh, uh, with replay. But when I came in the league and we had these ballparks with fan, fan interference. When you worked second base, you worked really deep because you wanted to get out there to see if you saw fan interference. Because, you know, um, i give an example. Um, we had uh, uh, in Philadelphia, you had uh, Veterans uh, Stadium. Yeah. And then they have the new ballpark. Um, and I can't think of the name, but Citizens Field, I think now. And uh, when we worked that, you worked really deep at second base because the way that one, the way the wall is in left center, uh, you had fan interference in there all the time. And a couple, you know, one of the biggest arguments uh, that I've had in that ballpark was a fan interference call. I think it was like 06, mm -hmm. 07. But, you know, it's changed with replay. The young guys think nothing of fan interference now. They know they can go right. to replay and, and somebody look at it. But when we didn't have replay, you know, right. fan interference was a big deal. So I'm showing my age by talking about fan interference with these ballparks because the young guys – you know, they, they think nothing of fan. It's like, oh, fan interference, well, we can go look at it, you know. <laughs> we right. didn't have it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and, and the last so thing you wanted was to be on da-da-da, da-da-da, watch this. So, <laughs> yep. uh, you know, a lot of that used to happen on ESPN. So the That's game's right. changed. The ball, have, did we approach it different? Yes. Now, not so much. Not gotcha. so much. You, have, you got the replay. So anything, boundary call, you can go look at. Right. Right, which is New York looks at. Well, so let's talk about that because I think uh, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you were the home plate umpire for the first replay game where replay was instituted in in 2008. Um, well, I'm actually two for three on that. Um, the first time replay was ever used, I was on the field for that with Frank Pulley, Ed Rapoport, right. and Greg Bonet. It was in Miami, right? It was in Miami. Yeah. Cliff Floyd, Cliff Floyd hit a ball. Uh, for the, I was working second base and Frank Pulley was, was working third and I saw it, it hit the wall and, uh, I, Cliff and I went through the minor leagues together and I saw Cliff hit second base and Pulley, uh, didn't call it a home run. Well, Cliff ran right to me and said, give me that. That's a home run. I said, no, it ain't. Well, he ran straight to straight to Frank Pulley and Pulley had a thing. He'd give this whistle. So he gave this whistle and then did, did this. Well, when 25 plus guys uh, come out of the dugout at you, chances are you might have missed it. Right. Well, the whole Cardinal dugout 
the whole Cardinal coaching staff, players, everybody charged out of the dugout. So Frank gets us all together, and he starts with seniority. Greg Bonet, what do you got? I don't know, Frank. Ed Rapolano, I'm not sure, Frank. He looked at me and said, Hoot, what do you got? He called me Hoot, Hoot Gibson. Mm -hmm. And I said, Frank Ball hit the wall. Are you sure? So with that, Frank started towards the camera. Greg Bonet went with him. I looked at Ed Rapolano. I said, is he doing what I – I said, he surely is not doing what I think he's doing. And Eddie had a great line. He goes, like, you're going to stop him? <laughs> so, right. so he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, who am I? I'm not going to stop him. But we had that one. We had one in uh, Tampa. And then the first official use, I missed a call in Milwaukee. I got over – I was the first guy to get overturned. So I, I when I talk to uh, schools and things, I talk about two out of three ain't bad. I'm, I beat meatloaf to it. So – there you go. There you go. Well, overall, what what is your take on replay? I know a lot of umpires have talked about it, um, and 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 in particular, what's it been like being in the replay center and being able to kind of watch your peers? It's the replay center. One of the greatest things about that, um, it's become such a teaching tool. Um, there, there's a group of you know when when I was in there, um, you know, a lot of times if, if there was young guys, they would ask questions, whatever, but. Watching other umpires is always a good thing, but watching what happens to the other umpires is even a better thing. And um, it, it's become, you know, and I hate to say this, but my generation, you know, we learned on a bar napkin in a bar after a game, uh, listening to the old guys talk that they went, you know, after the game, they went to the bar and had a drink and you got out a cocktail napkin and, you know, turned it like a diamond and, and away they went uh, teaching stuff. Right. And uh, now, uh, the replay center, that's one of the great things about it is because guys, you, you get in there and you see one of the things about it, the, the thing, the one thing I don't like is sometimes the ballparks are not fair to our guys when they show a definite, they got it definitely right. right. And they're still showing something that may look like they missed it. Right. You know, if we're going to use it, let's use it right. Right. You know, and, and sometimes uh, I, I believe in ballparks, they try to, persuade and not and, and they should know they've they've been schooled you know in new york a lot of times there's angles that we see they don't see uh right. there's and, and the 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 monitors are so incredibly uh powered in the, in the bandwidth um you know you can see we when we first got 4k i remember uh, a steel play in toronto and we were all amazed that you could count if you wanted to you could have counted the little pebbles we could see it that clear and they can blow things up. They can, the, the techs in that room, the technology in that room, if they're able and they're getting good at it and they're able to show our guys, you know, when they definitely, we need to, when we need to overturn a call and then when we need to stand a call and then when we need to confirm a call and um, we've gotten faster at it, we've gotten better at it. One of the things that we've learned lingo, I didn't think we'd ever learn. I need, uh, you know, we, we know where the cameras are at now. I right. need uh, low first base, low, Where's you sit down? Where's my super slow mo's at? You know, you learn, and you and sometimes um, the techs they they get a little excited because they're fans and they don't realize we're not. Right. Uh, when when something happens in that room, you may not have anything, but it gets a little intense for you know the two minutes, five minutes, whatever. Sure. And uh, because you know you're an extension of that crew and you want to you want to get the call right. right. At the end of the day, you want to get it. Our job is to be fair and get the call right. And uh, there's times when you follow the policy, if it's not clear and convincing, sometimes people don't understand, but we don't look at it through the fans' eyes. You know, uh, like my youngest son is a huge Saints fan, and there's been times I've said, you know, uh-uh, that's, you know, he'll, he'll think of something watching a game, and I'll look at it and I'll say, no, <laughs> right. because he is a fan of that team. And so it's – when you look at it from a neutral standpoint of, you know, you don't, it's hard for people to imagine that I don't care who wins or loses a game. Right. I enjoy, I enjoy right. watching, you know, NFL football, the playoffs with the NBA uh, playoffs with MLB, because I like watching the officials. Um, I, I, I went to high school basketball game last night and they was working three men and I was watching how guys move and if they were looking for angles and, so I really don't care, you know, the, the, the fan in me is gone. So when we look at something, we look at it from a different perspective than any fan of a game can look at it because the fan is not in us. Um, right. You know, we're, we're looking at it totally. We don't, we just want to get it right. 
or what we, you know, in our heart, what we believe is right. Right. And, and you, you know, you guys take your craft to heart and everything. When you go back on the field after working in the replay center or having done it multiple times, does it, do you feel a little bit gun shy? Like, oh my God, all these, I know these cameras are here. I better not mess up. Or you, or, or do you really just stick to your technique and, and your training? It's, it's one of those things you kind of, with everything in our career, one of the things that I, I tell it's hard, again, I'm showing my age. When I came to the big leagues night, every game was on television. And the old guys used to talk about the red light coming on the camera in center field. And you saw that. Right. And now the young guys coming up, they think nothing of it because they've been trained to work with, um, um, with all the cameras, with replay, with, with, with the box, with, with everything. And, you know, all my, for me, you know, when replay first came in, there was anxiety of, well, if I miss a call, it's, you know, it's like going to the principal's office and getting, the, you know, paddling. Uh, you, you, nobody wants to miss. Nobody wants. Right. To. But honestly and truly, uh, the players think nothing of it. When they overturn a call, they just want to know you got it right. You know, I always wore that. Um, I had, a, you know, I always had a hard time with, uh, I, I didn't like to fail. I didn't like to miss. Um, and and I, I work pretty hard sometimes. And one, one of the biggest things is, over time, you just learn to realize that you are going to fail. You are going to make mistakes. You are going to mess up. Uh, my feet hit the floor every day. I'd say, dear God, please don't let me mess up today and mean every word of it. Right. Uh, but, you know, did I have bad games? Yes. Did I ever miss a call on purpose? No. I thought at the time I was right. Right. Uh, and other things have proven me wrong. But when I made a call, you know, it was because, well, that's what I thought I saw. And Sometimes I feel like I should have went back and had my vision checked because I was like, I'd watch things and say, that is not what I saw. But, right. you know, when you watch the replay on it, it is what it is. So, you know, the technology has been good. There's some things, the facets of replay I don't like. But overall, you know, when you miss a game ending play, I, I love the fact that we can go back and correct that. Right. Um, an umpire can't have another call named after them. Right. There's a few more things that that we wish we could look at. Uh, but in time, uh, I think they'll, they'll make that decision and, and correct some of those things. But overall, um, I think replay, you know, like I said, it's been good for the game and the fact that, you know, uh, even though there's 27 outs or for both sides, uh, they look at it. If, if one call at the end of the game goes against that, well, you cost us that game. That Well, not, not really. Right. You had 27 opportunities. But did I miss one at a very unfortunate time? Absolutely. Right. Uh, and and you just want to take that away, and that's the one thing that I do like about replay. And and it, you know on the positive side, it really shows how awesome you guys really are, and, our guys and how are, correct you are. I mean, our that, guys, you know. Are, you know, one of the things about it, our guys are very good, and the younger guys, they're incredibly talented. Yeah, incredibly talented. Um, and uh, uh, they showed it this past World Series. Um, yeah. it, it just they're incredibly, incredibly talented. And the one thing I try to remind them though is. You're not going to be 35 to 40 forever. You right. will turn. Right. You will get it. You know, it's hard for them to imagine because I was that guy. Right. And I remember guys walking over me and going, ah, just remember. Right. So that's one thing I try to tell them right now. You can, you know, Harry Wendelstead had a saying, always find young guys that can run and see. Well, for years, I was that young guy that could run and see. And then I became that guy that said, uh, I need that guy that can run and run see. And see. There so, you go. You no, know, it's they're incredibly talented. Incredibly talented. Awesome. Well, let's. So we were talking about your your first game in Major League Baseball, and then in, in just two years later, with probably under 100 games on your belt, you were hired in as part of that you know famous uh, mass resignation attempt in 1999. You were hired one of the 22 time, 22 guys, um, and then in 2000, you were put on your first crew and mixed. Uh, first time that both AL and NL staff are mixed together. What was that experience like for you as someone who was in it and, and, you know, with, with still very junior at the time in your experience, in major league baseball, um, how did that form your entrance into your career there? It was a rough way to go for a few years. Um, there was some, there were some, uh, there were some feelings that ran deep and, you know, one, one of the, I was blessed. Um, I got to work with a guy named Chuck Merriweather. Um, and Chuck Great has since guy. passed, but Chuck, uh, Chuck would say, it's okay. It's okay, bud. You'll be all right, bud. And Chuck would pat me on the back. And, uh, so my first year on a crew, um, it was, a, it was, it was a tough experience. Steve Ripley made me tough. I tell him, 
Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed work. You know, Steve, Steve was big in the union. I won't get into that, but the long and short of it is um, Steve and I have developed a friendship over the years. Um, I look back on, there was a lot of things he taught me that I appreciate. I, I didn't, you know, it's kind of like with your dad, you didn't, right. and I'm not, Steve, I'm not saying you're my dad because I don't want to get yelled at, but um, <laughs> it, there's a lot of experience you go through with an, an older person, let's say that, that you don't really appreciate at the time. And you look back on it and you realize what they did for you. And, and Steve did that. And, and then Chuck Merriweather, um, Chuck was absolutely, uh, he was just an awesome individual and he was, yeah. he was fun to work with. He was great in the locker room. He was great. You know, travel days with Chuck, we always had fun. Um, we yeah. always had. Fun. So, you know, it, was it a tough time? Yes. But it was one of those things where I went to different ballparks. It opened up my uh, baseball vocabulary and umpiring even more because, you know, there was differences in the leagues and how right. they played the game and how they approached the game. And so um, it, it was, you know, I, I don't look, I look back on it now and, you know, it was, it was, it was a tough time, but it was one thing that like I tell our, our group, the group that came through that um, uh, we saw all the changes. Um, when you think about 99, not every game being on television to ZE to uh, replay to uh, uh, the box on, you know, just all of the technology that's come into play um, that I saw. Uh, right. it, it's just, you know, the game had been played for over a hundred years, a certain way. And then all of a sudden over my career, it changed and it changed big time. Um, right. and so to, to see that transition and to be, to be able to see the old school ways and now the new ways, you know, I saw the transition and, and it was, you know, I saw it up close and personal and, uh, yeah. um, it's, it was definitely, it was a cool experience. How hard was it, you know, so for our amateur umpires that are out there, you know, they're used to working their association rules and, and whatnot. But, you know, when you're a major league baseball umpire and you mentioned previously NL, now mixed league, you one day you're in an NL park, next day you're in an AL park, you know, different rules at the time that that's obviously been resolved now. How was that just switching almost every series or every other series and say, oh, are we in an NL park? Do I have to worry about the pitcher hitting and all that kind of stuff? It, it really, because we went through the minor leagues, we had the DH. Um, so it wasn't really um, uh, for us, the younger guys. And they only really had three different three differences in the rules. And they, they cleaned that all up in 2000. And the rules became um, the same across. There was a few things on pickoffs and a few things that was a little different. But for the most part, there was only three, you know, different rule changes. Obviously, the DH is now everywhere. But for us, it really wasn't, you know, um, the big thing was when, when you went to a National League ballpark and you had a younger guy with you, you just, you know, hey, pay attention to that double switch. Uh, pay attention, you know, a couple things we can't fix. You can't, if you mess up lineup cards, you mess up ground rules. Um, you can't fix that, but everything else you can fix. So, um, just the big thing was just paying attention when you work the plate, that plate meeting, pay attention to your lineup cards. That's, that's the biggest thing. Gotcha. Now, as you went through your career, uh, you worked with Jerry Davis quite a bit. I want to yes. talk about, uh, I, I know I've heard you speak before about how he was a great mentor for you. Talk a little bit about that relationship. Cause I think you must've been on his crew about 10, 10 or so, maybe more times. Oh, um, I, we call it going to uh, GDU, Jerry Davis University. Uh, <laughs> Brian Gorman got his master's degree. I can say I got my doctorate. There you go. Uh, I went for the full seven. Um, I call it. There's only two guys that I ever called chief, and that was Harry Wendelstead and Jerry Davis. And and I, I call him now and say, "How's Mrs. Chief?" Um, you know, Jerry Davis was a he was a lot of fun to work with on and off the field. He kept the locker room light. We played cards. We had a good time. He loved to go to dinner. Uh, there, there was just a lot of things that, you know, we enjoyed together. Um, and he was just, you know, he, he had, he, so, you know, we would start, I would start laughing. He told the same five or six jokes, um, you know, right before he retired, I told him, I said, you know, I hope I get to speak at the eulogy um, at his <laughs> retirement party. I emceed the retirement party. Um, you know, he, he just someone that I really enjoyed working with. He was very respected. Um, and it was kind of funny there, Chief and I had a run there where 
Uh, they don't do it much anymore, but it wasn't uncommon for me and Chief to have two AAA call-ups. We started the season, uh, Brian Knight and Scott Berry had not been hired yet. We started the season with two AAA call-ups in uh, 2010. And so, uh, you know, when we were out there, you know, Chief knew I had his back. Um, and it was just, it was a really cool experience. Um, you know, J Jerry Davis worked 5,000 games, most postseason. Um, my last, um, well, 2018, we worked the NLCS together. That was his last time working the playoffs. And um, I got to work. He was a, Jerry Davis was across from me when I worked Randy Johnson's perfect game. And Jerry Davis was across from me when I worked uh, the NLCS in 2018 in game seven. Um, you know, he's been across from me, you know, he'll give me that, you know, and chief and I had a way he, of, uh, he would look at me and I would know exactly what he's thinking. And, you know, you sometimes I'd be laughing. I worked with some guys. They didn't want you to laugh. You know, chief was like, Hey, Hey, go out there. Let's have fun. And right. uh, that was what we did. And that was one of the, you know, Jerry kept it in playoff games, in the regular season, you know, he, he just had a way of keeping everybody relaxed and loose and let's just go have fun. Let's you know, yep. uh, best team on the field, boys, here we go. You know, um, he kind of, and, and you, you wanted, you know, you knew he was working hard. You wanted to work hard and right. he was just, he was just a ball to work with. Well, he's awesome. a great teacher. He does a lot for little league. Um, yeah. Uh, he's just, I hope he. I hope he gets a nod for the Hall of Fame. Um, he's, he's, it. he's done a lot uh, for Major League Baseball and with Major League Baseball. And uh, this the just incredible, you know. And as, aside from the umpiring, he was just a lot of fun to work with. We always right. had we always had a good time together. So that, that's if gotta be so watching, important. I'm going to I'm going to jump on a plane, fly out to Orange County. We'll go to the Sugar Shack real soon. I promise. So. There you go. Well, that's, you know, and it's great having a mentor like that. And, and, and let's talk about that. You became crew chief in um, this year, the beginning of 2022, and you basically inherited his crew or the crew that you guys were on together. Um, was that planned or was that just kind of natural? And, and how no. was that transition? I've been filling in as a crew chief for years uh, just to finally get the nod in the, um, and, and it, you know, only got to be it for two months, but to finally for the league to say, okay, we're going to, we're going to give you your own crew. Uh, I had been filling in for years. Um, right. So it really wasn't, um, I wish I'd have been healthy. I, I would have loved to have seen what I'd been able to do if I, if I had been healthy. Um, but I remember looking at Will Little and Rob Drake and saying, something's not right, boys. Something's not right. Um, and we found out something's not right, but yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would have loved to have had the opportunity this year. If I had been healthy last year, uh, the first part of the season, uh, I was extremely healthy, extremely excited, coming off a, a big knee surgery. I tore my knee up in 2020 mm -hmm. uh, because of COVID and a freak accident. And uh, I, I would really love to have seen what I've been able to do if I was healthy. Uh, but, you know, God had other plans, and it wasn't in the cards. And, uh, you know, it just, for me, I was, you know, one of the things about it with Jerry Davis and some of the guys, we, we always had a young guy with us. Um, I've told Nick Marley, I've told, um, Dan Merzell the last couple of years, who else have I told, uh, I need your social security number so I can claim you on my taxes. You know, yeah. I've bought bills and, and stuff. And, and, um, you know, it was one of those things where, um, uh, you know, you want to let a guy grow, but you, you know, I was maybe sometimes too protective. I wasn't going to let anybody mess with them. Um, right. there, there's a certain thing you go through as a young official, young umpire. Uh, they want to try you. They want to see what you're like. They want to know your personality. And, you know, I would let them, but no, um, no, you're not messing with my guys. So, uh, but as far as, you know, watching guys work and I would tell guys, you know, I remember uh, one of the things that I would say to young guys is now you've got your job, go master your craft. Um, take a little bit from everybody. Um, I don't work exactly like Davis. I don't work exactly like a lot of guys I worked with, but, there's a lot of things I've taken from each and every one of them and, and go be yourself. Don't try to imitate, be, be who you are and, um, uh, and develop your own, your own style, your own, you know, charisma, your own, your own way of doing it. Um, when I look at John Tumpain, um, 
I think he's one of the best at it. I love to watch Tump work. Right. Um, it's a fun guy he's, to watch. He's very uh, – uh, Tump's one of them. Tripp's one of them. So, um, um, you know, Pat Holberg, I tease him that uh, he looks like um, McClellan's love child. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, he – these guys, they they just – it's fun for me to watch them work because they've taken a little bit of everybody and I can see that. And so it's really fun for me to watch those guys work. Well, that's awesome. I want to get into equipment a little bit. Um, you for a period of time, use the, the hockey or a hockey or a bucket mask for a while. And then you switch back. Um, talk us through, through that and how you would, how that worked for you and, and what you would recommend for others. I, I wore the hockey. I went through a series of concussions and uh, I wore it for a while. Uh, the guys at All-Star were great, but over time and as much as we wore it, whatever, I started to know some things with my neck. Um, and not only that, I kind of wanted to go back to the way I knew I was at the end of my career, and I wanted to go back to the way I came in, that was with a hat and mask. And, you know, 2017, there was just a lot of things happened. Um, and uh, 2018, I, I just decided I'm going to go out the way that I came in. And that was with a hat and mask. And I just made the switch back. Um, there's nothing wrong with a hockey mask other than um, you, it takes some time to getting used to. Uh, the, the, the look is a little different. The weight's a little different. Um, but um, All Star makes a great product. Um, and I was uh, that's what I wore uh, from about 2002 on. Um, I, I wore All Star uh, helmet and then the All Star mask. Um, I got rocked pretty good a couple of times and um, I was very happy um, with my equipment. So, also, now it's, it's interesting. It seems like more and more these days, I mean, maybe it's just more public, but um, it seems like there's far more injuries. Uh, balls are moving faster, pitchers are throwing harder, et cetera. Um, are you, do you recommend any? Other changes that that umpires should invest in. I know I see a few major league baseball umpires using the hard shell, the uh, hat, the you know for, for better protection. Um, is it really just up to the umpire? Is it is it technique that you really should focus on, or or is the game changing? It's faster than it was. I think we're more aware. Uh, one of the things about it when when you got hit in the minor leagues or we were early in our career, it was kind of part. You know, it was one of those things where. Uh, we didn't know. Uh, one of the things about it, and I hate to use this reference, but when we went the war on terror and uh, uh, concussions uh, with the military came became to the forefront, and uh, I remember I, I got um, I got hit. When was that? It was um, I can't remember the. It was two thousand three when I suffered my first really bad one, and. Um, um, I went to um, the University of Pittsburgh was on the cutting edge of um, a lot of technology with concussions. Um, and I was in there uh, with a couple of race car drivers and, you know, you didn't hear a lot about concussions. And I think it's not as much as the game is changing is just the awareness of what head injuries can do. And we learned that from the war on terror and these young men coming, young men and women coming back uh, with the effects from uh, uh IEDs and things like that. And, and then, you know, uh, we became more aware of concussions and, and the effects and the long-term effects and what can happen. And uh, so with that, I don't think as much as it's gotten bigger, faster, I think we're just more aware of the possibility of injury and life affecting injury, uh, lifelong, uh, you know, there's so much more we know today than what we, we didn't know. And I don't think it's that we're not tougher. Uh, I, I got hit many a time, went back out there probably when I shouldn't have. I don't know a lot of other guys did, but I think when you start thinking about longevity of your life and the health that's there and the resources, I think it changes your, uh, your approach. So guys are more willing to say, uh, -uh nope. Right. Right. Health is obviously more important in the forefront. Um, one thing unique to you is at, while you were, uh, major league baseball umpire you were studying to to get um you know start your own business in insurance um what was that journey like and, and what's it like now just completely pivoting careers and how's been uh, you know how do you recommend that for others who might might be doing the same at the end of their career find your passion find something you want to do that you're passionate about um you know I, I will say this you don't get a lot of um 
fulfillment in life saying ball strike safe out. You know, I get to help people every day. I've got a couple coming in. Uh, they reached out to me. They've got some life insurance needs. But um, in 2016, State Farm reached out to me. Uh, 2015, 2016, I said, hey, um, I, I called uh, my State Farm recruiter. Uh, we started, I was actually worked at a State Farm office with Bob Munich Insurance, uh, Bob Munich State Farm for two, two off seasons. I left Bob. I went with uh, Adam Yeager at Thornburg in Huntington, West Virginia. That was commercial. And then um, in 2018, I got home from the playoffs and I said, um, I think I'm going to hang my own shingle out. And um, we opened our office. Um, actually, I had had a back issue and I was home, just got lucky. I guess God had a plan. And um, uh, I was so I was trying to get my back fixed and um, uh, I was home for about, I think, six weeks. But my office would, was scheduled to open in June of 2019. We opened the office. Um, I've got 16 me, 10 team members, and um, uh, it's great. You know, I'm I'm principal agent. Wow. I went back to school. I got my finished up my degree in risk management and uh, insurance from Eastern Kentucky University, and they got a great program. They were awesome with me. Um, and then I went and got my CIC uh, designation, specializing in commercial. I'm working on a couple other things. I found out I can go back to school and I do pretty good um, with my accent and everything. I'm not as dumb as I sound. Um, so not. Uh, I, I just, and one, th I, I just enjoy uh, people. I enjoy, you know, uh, what we're, what we're able to do in our community. And I, I'm enjoying just, uh, um, it's my new passion. And, and I, I've worked with, I know other agents are like, are you nuts? And I'm like, no, I just, you know, it was an easy transition. I've been a necessary evil my whole life. Um, sure. So, uh, but I specialize in commercial. Um, I got two ladies in my office, four ladies in my office that everybody does personal PNC, personal home and auto. Um, and then Rich in my office does uh, Medicare. Tammy does AFLAC and Jennifer, Teresa, uh, Carla and Aaron. Um, they keep me straight. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I enjoy it. And, and for me, uh, what we've built, what we've done. It's kind of funny. Everybody said, you know, it's kind of like umpiring. Everybody told me I wouldn't make it. And I got into this and everybody said, uh, you're right not going to do good and all this other stuff. And then, you know, it's, it's the Nate. I just, I just keep laughing at them and going on because, you know, I love proving people wrong uh, and uh, we're going to continue to do it. Um, and uh, I get on roofs, I get under houses, I go, you know, I guess it's the empire in me. When I take you on, I take you on. Uh, there you go. It's that mine. mentality. So yeah. it's there. But anyway. Well, one, one, one last thing I want to get to, because it was also very important, the work that you're doing with UMS Care and especially helping some of the folks that were suffered a lot of issues with natural disasters and flooding in, in Kentucky. Talk a little bit about that and, and how that's also impacted you. Um, well, what I'm doing is nothing compared to what a lot of others has done. We're just trying to do a little bit. Um, uh, when the flooding happened, um, Ump's Care reached out to me, um, asked me to go down and visit uh, with some uh, some amateur officials, local officials. And uh, I went down and had lunch with them. The stories they told were absolutely unreal. Uh, one couple that I met, um, husband and wife, they talked about hanging on to a tree for five hours, not knowing if the water was getting higher, if the water was getting, mm -hmm. you know, it was just, uh, we lost uh, 40 some people. And, and um, you know, uh, they're very proud people. They're, very, you know, I come from that route. I come from, you know, I, I am one of those. Um, yeah. And the tide trucks came in and helped them get their clothes clean. They lost, they lost houses. They lost everything. But one of the things they talked about was shoes. And right now in my office, we're holding a shoe drive. Um, we're collecting money to go buy shoes. And then we got people coming in, bringing brand new shoes, brand, not, not used, brand new shoes. And, Next week, uh, uh, me and some other people, we're going to go down. Um, we've reached out to the people in that area about how to, uh, to, to make this happen. And, and we're going to give, we're just going to take shoes down. Um, one of the things about it, this happened back uh, in the summer and it, with any disaster. Um, and I know, I know people that are involved with the tornadoes in Western Kentucky. It's been a year later, Mayfield's still struggling. Uh, Trip Gibson's hometown. Yeah. And, and it's, it's after something like this happens, the media rushes in and gives you all this attention and then you kind of get forgotten about. And one of the things that we're trying not to do is, is to let um, um, 
these people think that they are forgotten because they're not. Uh, so we got, I got, it's take a picture with Santa on Saturday. We've got, you know, um, we're expecting a pretty good crowd, but what, what I do is, is nothing compared to what a lot of others do. We just try. Um, and one of the things about it, it's, you know, and I say this humbly, I, I don't do this for the attention. I do this because I love my people. I love where I'm from. I'm a hillbilly from Eastern Kentucky and I'm proud to say that. And, uh, um, these are our people and, uh, we just want we've done things for our people for years. And it's, um, obviously, um, when you're in business, one of the big things now is, is how much are you giving back? And, uh, and that's, that's what we want to make sure that we're doing in our community and not because we have to, because we want to this, these are my people, uh, and yep. giving back is just incredible every day. So well, that's, that's awesome. what I'm enjoying doing. I think it's an amazing spirit and it's a, and I'm scared it's a great charity where you can, you can help and, and help out people that are in need and, and the work that you guys do with, especially with the kids in the hospitals, I think is outstanding. So Greg, just to, it's been a great chat. I really appreciate your time. And, you know, it's always been a, it's always been a joy watching you on the field. Um, so to kind of close out, you know, you mentioned 30 years on the road and now you're finally sitting at home. What, what's one big memory that, that sticks with you from, from your time there and, and what, you know, what was your favorite city and ballpark? And like, what, what are, what will, what will you always smile about as a major league baseball? Empire? Walking on the field. You know, I had a thing, Freddie Gonzalez gave me crap for years, but buddies of mine are Kentucky state troopers. And one of the things about it, when a trooper gets out of the car, they put their hat on. Yeah. And for me, I didn't wear my hat out of the locker room. When I walked on the field, I put my hat on kind of a, it was a kind of, for me, a way of saying, okay, it's time to go to work. Uh, and, and Freddie would give me crap all the time. Why don't you wear your hat? Why don't you wear your hat? Uh, but it was, it was something for me. Uh, anytime you get a walk on a major league baseball field, that's memorable. Uh, right. You know, I look back on it now. Is there certain events and things? Randy Johnson's perfect game. Uh, Clayton Kershaw's no hitter. I would have had two perfect games. Hanley Ramirez made an error in the top of the sixth. Uh, if he hadn't have done that, I'd have had two perfect games, but um, you know, just the experiences that I had, um, Every major league ballpark is fun when you walk on the field. Now that I look back and, you know, all the experiences I had, all the people, guys, I got a chance to work with, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's been an incredible journey. Um, I'm glad it's over. I'll right. be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, I was ready. Um, but um, um, when I look back on it, you know, my great, great, great grandchildren will be able to see who I was right. with technology. Now uh, okay. they'll be able to see things that I did. Uh, you're only two generations removed from being forgotten. I won't be. Right. They'll be able to find me. If they want to find me, they'll be able to find me. So that's right. That, that's probably the cool thing. But other than that, you know, for me, it was always a job. It, I never wanted it to be my identity. I never wanted it to be, you know, oh, that's Major League Umpire Greg Gibson. I wanted it to be, hey, that's Greg. He's a pretty good guy. Um, and that's yeah. kind of the attitude. Um, you know, it, it, that's why for me, it's been an easy transition because I always approached it. I had a very, uh, I had a very um, high profile job. Right. Um, that was about it. Uh, when I, it, one of the, and I'll leave you with this, one of the biggest transitions of getting into this, when it, where I live in Eastern Kentucky, I was able to come home and disappear. People didn't see me. I mean, I came home, I like to stay home and, you know, I, I, I hunted, I fished, I, I was pretty much, you know, I was, I lived a crazy lifestyle for eight months and to come home and be able to do nothing uh, and relax and just coach my kids, my boys, um, you know, I took them to school every day. I, I did things with my, my sons. And so for me, that was my life. And uh, now that, that we've gotten into insurance and everything and, and you know, we've, um, are we using our notoriety to our advantage? I worked hard for it. Yes. Uh, it wasn't like it was given to me. I worked for it. So other than that, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm just enjoying life. I'm living my best life. Well, so. I think that's really wise advice. And you certainly set the example on the field and now off the field, wishing you all the best in your uh, next career with your insurance. Have a Merry Christmas. You too. Be well. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.